I hear you, man. <laughs> so uh, scrolling it a little bit forward for you, draft night, 2008. How did you spend that night? And what motivation did you get from going in the second round, going to Indianapolis, home of Peyton Manning, the general? Yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I, I played center in college, so I um, had some ideas because um, they did the draft a little bit different back then. Um, but in the second round, there was a couple teams that were like that needed a center that maybe they would reach up and, and try to grab me. Um, but once that last team kind of was off the board, I was at my parents' house, just kind of low-key family. And um, like the Colts were coming up and like my agent was texting me. I'm like, the Colts have Jeff Saturday. Why, why they wouldn't pick me. And all of a sudden my phone starts ringing and it was, um, it was, uh, Tony Dungy. And I was so confused, but so happy at the same time, because in my mind, it had never it occurred. Like, obviously, you know, um, being an offensive lineman, the more positions you can play, the better, um, chances you have of sticking around and playing. But at that point, Everyone was telling me that you're going to get drafted to play center. Obviously, um, the Colts have had one of the best of all time anchor in the middle for Peyton Manning. And Tony Dungy said, you know, what? we're going to draft you to play right guard. And I said, yes, sir, let's do it. And, and talked to Bill Polian. And that was a really exciting time. And um, it wasn't until later in my NFL career that you really kind of look back and are appreciative of where you get go because the draft you don't get to pick where you get to go it's one of the weirdest um, aspects that I look back now that most careers you get to have some say right you go apply for any job you want this is a job that you're applying for but you don't get to choose where you go and I have a, a lot of friends who went to other clubs that were not run the same way um, as the Colts or had the same leadership I mean I'm in, infinitely blessed with being able to grow up and mature under the leadership of guys like Peyton Manning, um, Jeff Saturday, some of those linemen that we just did life together with for, for so many years. Um, there, there's a lot of places. And then you start going to different clubs and realize not every, not every NFL team operates the same way. Not every, not every locker room's the same, has the same maturity. Um, so it was really a, a, a huge blessing to go to an organization that from the top down, it, it, it was high class, high class men who were trying to do things to win on in the football field and had been very successful. Um, I think the Colts during those 2000 eras were one of the what, most wins or the second most wins of all time in that period. And it was because they, they had high expectations and they didn't, they didn't bring in guys who were going to make excuses and, and not do the right thing. So getting into immersed in that culture was, 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 was immensely um, kind of, it gave me the foundation of like who I am today, no doubt. So uh, you brought up Tony Dungy. He's probably one of the greatest coaches of all time. What were some of the, the lessons that you learned from him in practice? Um, well, I always kind of joke because most football coaches are kind of like that hot headed, like screaming at you. And we had some of those, but, but, uh, coach Dungy was the opposite. He, he was like, if you messed up, he'd like put his arm around you and go, man, I'm, I'm kind of disappointed in you that you didn't pick up that blitz or you didn't, you forgot this play or, and that disappointment, like that father figure disappointment was almost worse than just a coach screaming at you you in the face so um learning how to i mean that was a lot different uh, style of coaching than i've ever been used to so so getting to see that i mean I, i'm a firm believer in every single coach i've ever had um, being able to take something good or bad and so every person i've ever impacted ever since or, or got to work with or teach um i feel like i've tried to come from that realm of coaching where the the screaming doesn't necessarily resonate with me like get, most players would build up a, a a thick skin and just okay it goes in one ear and out the other and I move forward at that level every coach has their own personality and you don't necessarily want the same personality but um th there's something about that father figure-esque type of 
mentality, coaching style that really got guys to buy into, hey, this is this is the way we're going to do things. Like, I, we may not like it. We may not like the the practice schedule or the amount of stuff that we're being asked to learn right now. But we understand what the purpose is for, is to win. And we have high expectations. We're not going to sit around and make excuses um, when things go wrong. And if, if people don't hit the mark, then we have to be able to be men about it and, and be able to offer criticism, receive criticism, and find a way to move forward. And, and I think I, I, I've had a lot of great coaches over the years, but there was definitely something very unique about Coach Dungey's um, philosophy. Yes, sir. So uh, going from the Colts to the Bengals, what were some of the similarities that you've seen in both the, the teams and what were some of the differences? Um, well, we had a, a really good offensive line room, um, guys like Andrew Whitworth, um, guys who could understand the game. The, the center that was there, Kyle Cook, was, was really good um, from a schematics under, uh, standpoint that I learned a lot just – different things that players look at during a game or during practice. Um, our offensive line coach, um, Paul Alexander came from a different place too, which was very, he was, he was much more technical than any other coach I, I had up until that point. And one of the cool things that I, I learned about him, like he was, he was this, he is this um, accomplished like concert pianist. And when he first moved to Cincinnati, his daughter was taking wanted to take piano lessons, but was a little shy. And so he said, you know what, I'll take lessons too. And he has a book about musicians and um, like professional athletes and, and the similarities. And I don't know if you can see in the background, like I play guitar. So music to me um, was always my escape away from the physicality of football, like the high intensity. Um, but I really connected to that coach, to that philosophy in that realm of, of really going away from, okay, how many plays can we run to what is this play? How can we um, kind of reverse engineer it down to its most simplest mechanic and really focus on the details? And I feel like I, I, I became my most well-rounded player during my time in Cincinnati because of that. Yes, sir. So with those uh, guitars in the back, which one is a Fender, man? I'm guessing two of them uh, are probably no, Fenders. No, nah, I don't got any fenders, man. <laughs> no, those are all uh, Paul Reed Smith. It's a, a custom guitar builder out of Maryland that um, I, I got hooked on at a young age. And once I, once I started getting some of those NFL checks, you know, uh, lots of guys buy cars and watches and fancy suits. I'm like, I'm going to the guitar store, man. We're going to go pick out some cool axes. I hear you, man. You never bought a Fender Stratocaster? Uh, no, nah, I got a... I got a, a PRS that's kind of like a Fender. Um, I, I'm not going to talk bad about Fenders, but the, <laughs> the craftsmanship of a Paul Reed Smith, for anyone who has ever played guitar, you put one of those in your hands, you never want to put it down. 